You know, again, if you don't make friends at this meeting, you're really missing the boat. And sometimes it just, you know, takes walking up to somebody and look at their badge and saying, where are you from? And, and uh, I actually keep a spreadsheet. And it's amazing because if I have a problem with somebody that's in California or in Michigan or Maui or whatever, there's always somebody you can call and talk to or, or say, hey, can you take a peek at this patient? So you just don't miss that boat. And Walter is, I, I tell you what, my wife wishes I was as nice as you, okay? You are always so pleasant. You always have such a great smile. My staff really wishes I was like you, okay? And he practices in Cali. Everybody wishes I was like him, damn. And he practices in California in Maui. And uh, maybe I could stay at your Maui house for like nine or 10 months, okay? No problem? All right, good, we'll talk about that. No, very interesting guy, he's gonna talk to us. You can say a little bit about yourself and your practice, Walt. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Niamtu and Dr. Obaji and to the Academy for inviting me here. Uh, I'm a cosmetic surgeon, and I have offices in Santa Rosa and Napa, California, and I have a boondoggle office in Maui. But Joe, you're welcome anytime to come and visit. Uh, so this is actually, this. I have no disclosures, and uh, this slide here is actually from the California Academy of Cosmetic Surgery meeting uh, this last fall. Dr. Michael Morissette was president, and was kind enough to invite me to speak. And this uh, slide, the title, kind of expresses is the way that I think that we should come to these meetings. We, we heard a lecture on duality by Dr. Naveen earlier today. Um, my duality when I come here is that I want to be open-minded, but I also want to be skeptical. So I'm actually hoping that I will kind of convince the ones who are skeptic about using acellular adipose matrix tissue and convert you to wanting to at least try that in your office if you can. I'm going to make sure that I get this correctly. Okay. Um, this slide makes me sad. Uh, Mark Berman uh, was my mentor for fat grafting, became a friend, amazing colleague, innovator. Uh, the world has great loss by not having him here. And I always want to acknowledge him whenever I discuss uh, fat grafting in any fashion. And thank you, Keto, for mentioning him as well. Okay, so uh, fat craft, uh, let's talk about, uh, AC I'm not gonna go into a lot about uh, beautiful lecture, Dr. Brad, on uh, acellular uh, adipose uh, matrix tissue, so you covered a lot of the biology of that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more clinically about how to use it. Uh, so this is one of my patients, a colleague, a nurse, who uh, you can see her pre-treatment. Uh, and then what I did was perform, she was one of, I think, my third patient that I performed fat grafting on after seeing Dr. Berman down in uh, Santa Monica. And I only injected 20 cc's of her autologous fat. Okay, 20 cc's. You start off slowly when you try a new technique, and then as you gain confidence, you begin to inject more. And nowadays, I'm injecting anywhere from 40 to 60 plus cc's of fat when I do pan-facial uh, rejuvenation. So we see after her first uh, treatment, at six weeks out, we can see uh, the improvement. But because I only put in 20 cc's, both she and I wanted more. So I had originally done liposuction on an area of her, and I can't remember what part of her body that I did it on. And uh, what I had learned from Dr. Berman was I put it, I labeled it, and I stored it sterilely in a freezer, just a freezer, okay? Uh, and then we brought her back. Uh, actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Abaji, I think you did a study at the University of Pittsburgh uh, radiographically. You followed fat grafting, and, and I believe the conclusion was that three months, what you see is what you're going to keep is good. I've been quoting you correctly. <laughs> good, after all these years. Perfect. So um, I, I waited three months, and then I went ahead and we did a second session, and I put another 20 cc's of fat in her face. Uh, some people, I'm going to go to this one here. So as I was describing this at another meeting, Dr. Guillermo Blugerman heard me talk about this, putting fat in the freezer and so forth, and he was kind of nodding his head at acknowledgement like, yeah, that's what we used to do. Okay, let's go back. So um, the, many of you, if you're skeptical, say, well, the fat cells died. Who are you trying to fool? You know, you just thawed it out and you injected it into the face. Uh, and certainly Dr. Yoshimura then did studies and said even with fresh autologous fat grafting, we think, you know, simplistically we put in fat, we put in micro droplets, we're going to get angiogenesis, those cells are going to survive. But indeed his theory was that 
all the fat that we put in, most of it actually will die, but we stimulate the stem cell cascade, and then what happens, because we put this target in, that we get differentiation of stem cells to then convert into fat cells, adipoblasts, then into adipocytes. And that was the theory. So it's my theory that even though we uh, use what might have been uh, lacking viable adipocytes uh, in the second session, that you can still get long-term results. How did we get this if those cells were dead? And so as fat grafting, and, and we used to have a lot of lectures on that, and I would listen to all these, and Dr. Berman and Dr. Obagi would be there, and I made all those lectures. Uh, we can see that over time, probably as the theories arose, what we were doing practically made some sense. And so we got long-term results. That's nine years later that you can see, okay? All right, so I'm not gonna go through this uh, right now because Dr. Barad did that. You may or may not know that I was actually a uh, organ transplant surgeon. I was a general vascular organ transplant surgeon. That was my core. So I was the one who would go in in the middle of the night and we would harvest livers and pancreases and kidneys. At that point then, we would leave the room and these were obviously wonderful human beings who would donate their organs for medicine and for others, but then the technicians would come in and they would harvest the skin and the fat and the bones. And so this particular product that's out now by, uh, produced by a company, we'll keep it generic here, was initially started off as a bone tissue bank, okay? So everything's been processed as would be appropriate in the days when I was an organ transplant surgeon, okay? So I'm gonna skip through these. And that was the process. So I'm just on this slide here, I'm not going to reread it. Um, Dr. Broad are, already described it, but just if you think, okay, seems like I might trust this guy, but is it really true? You know, you put in cadaver fat, if you will, and it's going to create new fat. Um, I can just, uh, as from a personal testament, tell you I'm old enough that I had some gingival disease, I needed to have surgery, I had some bone resorption, so my dentist didn't really even talk to me much about it, but he was going to put a cadaver bone graft in as well to give some support. So he did that for me. And so initially you get support from the tissue that's been implanted or transplanted. Uh, then macrophages begin to go in and begin to break down that tissue. You get fibrosis, but indeed what happens, You because we put that target tissue in, we then get the differentiation of the stem cells, and now my stem cells are uh, converting into osteoblasts and then into um, osteocytes. So that's the process, if you want to think of every day, um, uh, example of this concept of uh, tissue transfer or tissue creation or regeneration. So this is, let's see, will it go? Okay, great. Um, it does have a toothpaste, uh, I, I believe, I uh, agree with Roxana, toothpaste-like consistency. It has to be diluted some. So basically I take a half cc of normal saline and a half cc of lidocaine and we put it together and then we just uh, pass it back and forth and everybody will have their own uh, sort of uh, protocols, I just do it 10 times. We'll keep on going. So uh, this young lady is a, uh, I think she's a nurse, um, maybe a PA. Um, she does a great job with, I, I like her because she's really educational in her posts. And so she, and I got her permission to use this. Uh, I love her uh, moniker, Ms. Glotox. And so what we did was um, she uh, drew uh, off what we see as facial deflation, okay, and it makes your brow sit lower. And then she drew on her face the area that she considers the temple and that when you do that, it supports it and raises the brow. I agree with this somewhat, but I would say is that I would take it one step further. And I think that um, we need to revolumize uh, even more aggressively than in the area that she's mentioning. So if we look at the, um, I guess there's not a pointer. Is there a pointer? Oh, on the mouse. Okay, so if we if we look at the um, if we look at this here, great. Okay, uh, we can see the the temple area here. It's very deep, and the frontal prominence right there. I think that's an important landmark. Also, if you look down here and you see how huge this temple is, most of us who started using PLLA, we were taught to take that PLLA, go into the temple really deep. It's a lot deeper than you think it is. You think you're sticking it into the temporal lobe and you feel you hit the periosteum and then you inject it. But indeed, Dr. Sadati, I was on a, uh, 
on a panel with him at another meeting, and his comment was when he, I think he showed a similar slide, he says, if you're putting the needle right down in the periosteum, you're beginning to revolumize underneath the muscle into the aponeurosis. So what are we doing? And since then, he made me inject more superficially. And I know from my experience with fat grafting that what I do is actually, um, I'm more superficial. I don't actually put a lot of fat deep in the temporal fossa. So uh, this is our practice administrator. She's a spin instructor. You can see, um, you know, she looks great. Years go by, and you can see the aging process, right, of, of facial deflation. And in particular, if you look at her temple area, you can see how she is indeed deflated in this area here, okay? And some people may even see, does she need a bluff, or has her brow dropped? Okay. So um, this is just me. Just You all know how to inject local anesthetic. I keep on going. So I do two mess. I'm kind of uh, an empath, so I don't like my patients to hurt. So I use uh, basically a 0.2% client solution. And the, the key here is that I, I like to, uh, and I maybe only use anywhere from 2 to 3 cc's, but I come way up in this area here, right up in the roof area, as Dr. Broad described, uh, under the brow and up along the frontal prominence here. I'm going to keep on moving so I don't run out of time. So now uh, what we have here is now we have the diluted uh, acellular adipose tissue matrix. And so I'm going way up high, a lot higher, I think, than most people would. And I'm aiming up for the prominence right here, the frontal prominence. Okay, and use, I only use a cannula. Dr. Broad has a lot more chutzpah than me. I will not use a needle. I use a 22 gauge cannula and I very rarely have to change it for uh, having a clog. Okay, so that's it. I, I am, oh, thank you. I am sub Q, so I'm not going deep. Okay, when I have a lot more fat, uh, autologous fat grafting, I go deeper, I go in layers. Because of the cost of the product, this I use at sub Q, okay? Probably for me, the limiting factor of this technology is just cost, and that's just the realities of our practice. And so here we go, and just on the contralateral side, and again, just to show you this, I'm gonna go slowly here, because I kinda wanna really define the areas that I treat, then I'll show you some before and afters, and we'll finish close to on time here. So you can see that I'm aiming up towards the lateral brow into the roof area. I'm actually a little bit higher than I wanted. I actually will go directly under the hair growth uh, is where I will, I will come. And you can see retrograde. I do use my thenar eminence uh, as opposed to my thumb. I think that you have better control. You don't put as much in a big bolus in. Learned that from Dr. Berman. Okay. And then I move it out towards the hairline. And so I got 30 seconds, so I'm going to move quickly. All right, so here we go. We have, uh, so you can see this is the area that I would inject with the fat. And then I think you can see that, I hope you can see that on there. Uh, the TV's a little bit better quality. But you can see where the, the autologous, excuse me, the uh, cadaver fat was placed. Okay, and this is at two weeks out. So you can see how it nicely lifts. Okay, now of course there's some swelling that will go down, but you can see how it nicely lifts. And I'm going to kind of use three months as when I'm going to do the next injection, thinking that that's when you're going to be seeing the uh, adipocytes being laid down by the body. So you can see the improvement here and here. Now this lady here, you might say, oh, that's just Botox. Actually, this, the, the, the pre-treatment photo is before neuromodulators and, and cadaver fat in her temple area. This is three to four months later, so the neuromodulators should be wearing off. So she got a fairly significant lift here, uh, which surprised me. Okay, the others are a little more subtle. Uh, this is a 40 plus year old woman and you can see her before and after photos looking at the temple area. And I just take these photos with an iPad. I do not change the, um, I do not change any lighting or anything. So if you can tell me why the pigment looks different on the skin later on, some techno person can tell me, maybe it's just makeup, uh, but I don't try to doctor these at all. And so you can see the improvement here. Okay, and it's just in the same room, same lighting. Uh, the last patient here is 40 plus year old young lady and uh, she had treatment here. Um, she is a believer in aesthetics. We just do little treatments uh, uh, continually and you can see the improvement here and ultimately that's what we want to get a brow lift. I do think that we're gonna see good results. I'm only out a year. I don't know uh, how long it's gonna be long term but I'm anticipating that we'll get years of improvement with this treatment and ultimately what, and this is her, ultimately what we want to do is to have our patients feel confident about themselves. Thank you very much.
That was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. We do have a few minutes for questions. I don't know if any showed up in the app, but we have some microphones as well. If you want to come up and ask questions. I have a couple of questions for Dr. Barad and Dr. Tom. With the Renuva, since that's the only agent on the market right now, I agree, it's very costly. And for those of us that do fat, it's very hard to think about not doing fat for patients because with the several syringes of the product, you can almost do a fat transfer. But for our patients who are very thin and don't have a lot of donor sites or metabolize things quickly, it's a great adjunct. When you want to put it in the tear troughs or in the temples, are you diluting it extra compared to when you're doing it in the malar regions, jawline, and so on? Um, Actually, I've recently changed, and I still do the one-to-one -one dilution, um, but it, it's just the amount that you're injecting is just to correction, so it may just need less product. But I feel that with a smaller dilution, I am judging how much they're going to need a little better than with a higher dilution. My thought is uh, that when you try to do one syringe of filler and you have patients that come in and they want you to treat everything on their face, um, I try to learn from my mistakes with that. And so I, I keep the, my same continued, uh, a little less than one-to-one -one dilution. And I primarily have been in, uh, I'm gonna say big fatty areas, temple area, the malar area. I am yet still a little nervous about using it in the tear trough infraorbital. I know with autologous fat, uh, Dr. Baji, you know, it's wonderful because you can use so much, and I, I'll put it right on the periosteum. I'll put it superficially right under the skin. Yeah. I love it. Um, I'm still evolving my learning curve with this. Right. I think if you inject in the fat pads, you know, there, we saw it with the superficial fat pads that are available there. I, I mean, it's worked for me and hasn't been an issue. Right. Question? Hi, Scott McCusker, Sacramento. Uh, for your photo problem, it's a white balance issue. I can show you how to fix that later. Um, but uh, anyway, my question, uh, one of the problems with some of these stimulatory fillers is if that patient ever needs surgery or needs a facelift, for instance, that a lot of that tissue has been scarred in and is really hard to dissect. Um, how would you address that and how do these newer options uh, address that? So the question is, how are some of these biostimulatory fillers going to impact subsequent surgeries? And since we have Dr. Nayamtu up here as well, and you do a lot of facelifts, and I'm sure you've encountered patients who've had a lot of biostimulatory fillers, have you noticed more fibrosis on those patients? Because You know, when you're doing a facelift, sometimes you come across surprises, you know, threads uh, yeah. more often. And I hear people talk about how difficult it is to dissect subcutaneously when people have had thermage or, or you know, Althera or some of these things. I, I no, I can't yeah. really yeah. notice a difference. Some patients dissect easy, as you know, like, like butter, yeah. and some you fight for every centimeter, but I, I can't uh, attribute that necessarily to their previous. Yeah, centimeter. I've seen more fibrosis after Renuvion which is not Renuva, they're all very similar names, but Renuvion tissue tightening, and then coming back in and doing a facelift, mm -hmm. there's a lot of fibrosis in those patients, even after a year. But I haven't seen it with fillers. Anyone else, Keita, have you seen that? Uh, just, uh, not so much in the face, but in the body. Can you? Oh, sorry. Uh, I've noticed that more fibrosis in the body than in the face because I don't I don't do a lot of su uh, subcutaneous renewal in the face just um, just maybe in the in the jowls and the neck and stuff but the neck duh, is harder to dissect if they have renewal it's very fibrous. Okay, Mona. Great presentations. I have a question about the fat freezing. I used to do that about 15 years ago when you were thawing it. The top layer of the fat that you're going to inject is kind of oily. How do you manage that if you were to do that nowadays? Sorry, the question. I'm sorry, it's hard to hear. Yeah, that. I'm yeah. sorry. The, the fat you're using, frozen fat, remember you oh, said that you've yes. used frozen fats? I used to do that all the time. But the top layer, what do you do with that when you're isolating the fat? Are you. Uh, 
Like so she's some, talking about after, is it after you defrost the fat, you're seeing oil surface at that correct, top of the Correct, because range. that's how it breaks so down. So when you're using frozen fat, are you taking extra steps to decant the fat before you re-inject it once you defrost it? Because I do agree. I mean, once you defrost it, you do have more fluid, even just not just oil, but you'll have more liquid at the bottom as well. So I typically just let the syringe sit for a while, and then I decant the bottom. I wick the oil off the top just with a little telfa pad, and then I transfer it into my 1 ml syringes. Do you do anything different? No, um, I would agree. The infranatant, uh, that little layer of infranatant, may actually have SVC, SVF, excuse me, uh, which obviously is beneficial. 